Well, thank you all for coming. Um, this is uh, the topic of uh, the distribution of income and wealth has gotten a lot of prominence in the last uh, few years, and, and obviously um, uh, a, a, a number of contributions. Uh, it was actually the subject of uh, my PhD. What? Oh, my microphone? Oh, okay. I don't know why they want a microphone, but okay. It was uh, the, the subject of my PhD thesis, and and in preparing for this talk, I went back and I looked at some. Of my, I gave a paper in, in Econometrica meetings in 1966 uh, on the subject, uh, and um, uh, for those of you who who remember that talk in 1966. <laughs> Um, there'll be a little bit of duplication, but uh, I hope not too much. So I hope I don't, bo uh, for those of you um, who, who, of course, remember everything like, I said. Like good wine. It just <laughs> gets better with age, right? So, so I hope I don't bore any of you who, who uh, uh, remember that too vividly. So um, uh, the question are, uh, I'm going to talk about what is to explain. Uh, there's some anomalies, um, and I'll focus on... Uh, the uh, key idea here is that wealth and capital are different ideas, um, and it's important to distinguish them, at least for different purposes. And then I'm going to talk about uh, theories of the equilibrium distribution of wealth, ignoring land, and uh, then I'm going to talk about land and credit, just uh, to anticipate. The big difference between uh, the kinds of theories that uh, we worked on back then and now is that uh, uh, back then, we were freeing ourselves from Ricardo. Uh, Ricardo talked about the importance of land. And modern manufacturing, one couldn't believe that land was important. And so all the production functions that all of us used had F is a function of K and L, uh, and not land, T. So uh, the new contribution is to put T back in, to so go back to uh, 200 years. So this is sort of a regression in progress. Um, the, uh, one of the, uh, uh, a, the, the key question is how do we explain the distribution of income and, uh, 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 among factors of production and changes in that di distribution among individuals? Is there an equilibrium distribution? And an important idea that was not always obvious in some of the recent discussion, there has to be consistency bet uh, between the micro and the macro. That is to say, if you have savings behavior of a particular uh, kind that have been postulated, that has to add up to macro dynamics that are consistent with the micro dynamics. And that's one of the things that my original paper did and that I'm going to try to do here. Now, when we were uh, growing up, um, there were a set of stylized facts due to Caldor, and I think those have probably still studied. Um, and um, the, the old, st I guess, the, oh, okay. Um, the old stylized facts were things like uh, constancy of capital output ratio, constancy of shares. Um, well, the new stylized facts are, and, and we worked very hard to explain each of these facts. And just as we got good theories explaining the facts, the facts changed on us. And so uh, uh, all the theories that were based on trying to explain these facts obviously have to be reexamined because they exp explain some facts that were no longer facts. So uh, uh, the new facts are that there's gro not constant uh, way, uh, 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 distribution, uh, of factor distribution, but there's growing inequality in wages, capital income, and wealth, uh, wealth, um, uh, and that the share of capital is going up rather than constant. Um, there's some uh, obvious fact, wealth is more unequally distributed than wages. That's been true for a long time. And with growing share of capital, it means the overall inequality in income is increasing even more. Uh, one of the, again, big changes is that we were trying to explain the constancy of the capital output ratio. And one of the new facts is the capital output ratio, or I should say the wealth output ratio, wealth income ratio, has increased uh, markedly. Um, The return to capital has not declined, even as the wealth income ratio has increased, and average wages have not increased, or not increased much, even as the wealth income ratio has increased. Um, 
An important idea that was in Piketty's book was the uh, period in which we were uh, growing up and the period in which we were writing was an historical anomaly. So what we thought were, were uh, the new normal state of capitalism now appears to be an anomaly. That is to say, the period from World War II to 1980 was, might be viewed as a golden age of capitalism. Inequality was going down, and that was enabled Kuznick's to make a statement, for instance, that in earlier stages of, of development, inequality might go up, but then it would go down. Uh, and that was fitting the facts pretty much at that time, but then beginning around 1980, uh, it started to go, uh, uh, to go up. So that's part of, of uh, for, uh, having worked so hard to explaining the old facts, uh, the new facts were obviously very disturbing and, and uh, 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 motivated uh, this research. Now, as we look at these you might, as facts or factoids, there are a number of what might be called anomalies if we treat W as K, so if you treat wealth as capital, and a lot of the discussion uh, of Piketty's book has treated wealth as capital. In fact, there was a discussion from what I gather uh, that came up in a, in a, in a uh, meeting that we had at uh, C, uh, uh, Cooney uh, with Piketty about uh, how the word, uh, with his translator, about how he should translate the word, and he said, no, it's capital, not wealth. Uh, and, and so it, clearly in his mind it was partly, it was, it was mostly capital that he was thinking about. Well, so what I'm going to do is when I'm talking about these anomalies, I'm going to talk about these anomalies under the assumption that we treat wealth and capital as if they were the same variable. Um, and if they are, obviously an increase in K over Y or W over Y is associated with an increase in the capital labor or capital uh, in the capital effective labor uh, labor ratio, capital divided by the effective labor, which is labor supply times the amount of equivalent units of labor. Okay, and ever increasing uh, effective capital labor ratio means an ever increasing wage rates. An important point is, and in, in, in paper I go through this. Even if you have many different kinds of capital, an appropriate aggregate, average wages, will go up. So yes, you could have skill bias technical change, you can have lots of different kinds of labor, but the average wage should go up. Um, and uh, the fact is that wages have been basically stagnating, and that suggests that something else is going on. The second anomaly re relates to explaining movements in factor shares. This is not quite as strong. The notion that you would have capital labor ratio go up and wages go down is, is, should be really disturbing. This is a little bit uh, 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 less disturbing. Uh, normally, if the capital labor ratio goes up and the elasticity of substitution is less than unity, the share of, uh, uh, the share of capital should go down. And there, there's a, an additional empirical hypothesis. The first only requires normal assumptions of concavity, of diminishing returns. This requires an additional assumption of an elasticity of substitution less than one. There's a lot of empirical evidence that elasticity of substitution is less than one. But for theorists who are skeptical of all empirical work, may be that all those empirical, cross-section empirical studies are wrong. And, Conceivable, the elasticity of substitution is greater than one. As a, as a footnote, uh, I should mention that if the elasticity of substitution is greater than one, there's some other theoretical problems. If you have a model of induced technical change, the basic notion of induced model of technical change where you have a, a, a trade-off between labor and capital augmentation is that the point on the trade-off is determined by the relative shares. And that means that if the relative share of capital goes up, then you do more capital augmenting technical change. And the effect of that is to increase further the share of capital. So the economy is unstable. And it goes off to a share of capital of one, a very unpleasant uh, result for workers. Um, anyway, 
Uh, I don't believe the last is substitution to create the one. I think the, uh, the, the overwhelming evidence is less, but if it is, there's some other problems. Um, the third anomaly is how can we explain the increase in wealth income ratio? And let me skip to the, the, the uh, 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 another way, a uh, simpler way of looking at this. Um, the rate of change of the capital stock is just S Y divided by K. This is a definition, by the way. Th this is nothing more than, th than definition. These are not theorems. And the kind of, the estimates that actually uh, Piketty and Zuckman provide is that S is 5.2% and uh, Y, a, a K over Y is four, roughly four in the period 1970. Uh, to uh, 2010, and that gives a rate of growth of uh, capital of 1.3 percent, and the rate of growth of income has been 2.8 percent. So the S is the net savings rate here, so net, take into account depreciation. So you have a problem that the data from the national income account says that the capital stock is supposed to be increasing at 1.3 percent. <coughs> income is increasing at 2.8 percent, and yet you claim that the capital output ratio is going up. And the gap here is, is large. I mean, the, the, the savings is explaining less than half of the increase of the wealth output ratio. So when, in other words, and this is a sort of an important, the way we think of capital accumulation is like a farmer doesn't consume some seed and he saves it for the next period. And so that's what this equation is saying. These are the seeds that are being saved. And now we've kept account of all the seeds and we look at it at the end of the period, seeds have been growing at 1.3%, but output's been growing at 2.8%. And yet you say the ratio of the seeds to output has gone up uh, not down. So there's a puzzle. And finally, uh, if you, what I just said is, is just a matter of definitions. There's no equilibrium theory here, no theory of the savings rate or how it got determined. But if you now embed what I just said into any of the kinds of growth models that we use, the solo growth model or, or a Cass Koopman's growth model or a, a, a Caldorian growth model, there is a theory of the long run determination of the capital output ratio in those models. <coughs> Each of those models gives a theory. There's no reason to believe that we would quickly be, we would be in long run equilibrium, but somehow you think I I if there's a big change, there ought to be a big change in parameters. And if you look at the underlying parameters, it's hard to think of changes in the parameters that could account for changes in the capital output ratio, even wealth output ratio, of the magnitude that have occurred in some countries, okay? Or in the world as a whole. So, um, you know, th there's some ambiguity, of, you know, uh, savings rates have been going down and that would argue for in the United States going the other way. Uh, labor force has gone down a little bit, but not a lot. Anyway, so these are some of the anomalies. Uh, the basic explanation that I try to put forward in the paper is actually a, a, a very simple one, and that is that W and K are different concepts. And uh, both concepts are aggregates. Uh, and the appropriate aggregate for one purpose may be very, uh, uh, may be misleading, wrong for another. So when you're looking at, at, at claims on resources, it's uh, appropriate to use current prices, the value of the assets relative to the value of the income produced. But that doesn't necessarily make sense from the point of view of analyzing production uh, output, uh, a production function. Uh, and, and an example of that is that, just from a theoretical point of view, it's very clear conceptually that wealth could go up because the price of land has gone up, and the price of land has gone up. So wealth could go up 
because the price of land has gone, gone up, and yet the capital stock, in the conventional sense, could have gone down. So it is not even clear that wealth in an economic sense moves in the same way as wealth in a financial sense. So obvious example, if the value of land in the Riviera goes up because Russian oligarchs want to buy land in the Riviera, at the end of the day, there isn't more land in the Riviera. It's the same amount of land in the Riviera. But if the result of that, if at the same time, people in France decided not to save in the way that I meant saving, accumulate seed, capital accumulation, there could be less capital stock. The country would be poor. It had the same land that it had before, but fewer seed, fewer capital goods, and it would be poor. So the notion of wealth in the sense of the wealth income ratio in the sense that you would use for distribution of wealth may have nothing, may be disjoint from what you would want to do for talking about uh, growth. So that's really um, uh, the basic idea. And, and here are just a, a couple of ways of trying to illustrate this. Uh, national income accountants talk about the amount of capital in this term volume. Uh, and I guess they're thinking, you know, physical capital stocks. So they're thinking about uh, greater volume. Um, if you had a simple aggregate function, uh, production function of the form y is equal to f of k plus t, so that would be capital goods and land were perfect substitutes, and so you would want to add up the volume of capital goods and land in an appropriately weighted index. Do you find? Then the appropriate measure of wealth for that purposes would be K plus T for the purposes of production. Okay? Now, um, actually, uh, national accountants have done this for a few countries. And one of the things is about th what you see about that is that measure of wealth, a value measure of K, not the, the value measure, the value measure can go in the opposite direction. So this is a chart that the OECD gave to me from, um, um, for France, but there are similar charts where you see that measure, the volume measure of K, K plus T divided by GDP actually going down, even though the physical capital goods were going up, and that's because you're weighting the increase in physical capital goods, you're adding to that something that's constant, and it's not keeping up with GDP. So that's one production function. Another um, production function that you could use is uh, uh, a geometric, oh, that's supposed to be K to that letter times T to the one minus that. Uh, so it's, it's a weighted average, a geometric weighted average. And uh, in that case, the, uh, the change in the log is xi times d log k. And then what's happening, if you go back to this picture, what's happening to that measure, you can really clearly see, if you multiply k, the k curve by this factor, xi, it shifts down. And it doesn't take a very high factor on that weighted average measure to have the, well, the, the, the aggregate capital measure to go down relative to y, okay? So these are all aggregates, these are all index number problems, but they have to be treated seriously, and, and the index that is pr appropriate for one purpose, as I say, it may not be appropriate for the other. So there are two, when you start thinking about this way, uh, you realize that uh, there are two, the, the, the basic explanation, the basic idea is that the increase in m wealth that's being observed does not correspond to an increase in productive capital. Okay? That there's not a corresponding percentage increase. And there are two possible explanations um, uh, one of them is that um, uh, 
there's uh, land, this fixed factor, which is just increasing in value, which is a capital gain. The other one is increasing competitive, uh, that, that the competitive equilibrium analysis that underlies most of our discussions is flawed. And uh, the way that plays out is the following. Uh, assume that the increase in the share of capital that's been observed is a result of more market power. That, you know, again, you have to think about this as an aggregate, and it's very hard to think about this because uh, different sectors over different time. But say network externalities have increased in importance. There's a lot of, a lot of literature that's suggesting that's the case. And there are big industries, you know, uh, Microsoft, uh, computer industry, uh, telecom. So there, there are large, you know, non insignificant sec uh, parts of the economy in which these network externalities are important and in which there's evident market power. Um, so you take that as hypothesis as one of the explanations for why the share of capital might have gone up. But if that's true and control of those rents is associated, is capitalized, which it normally would be, that means those rents are capital. I mean, that, that becomes part of wealth. Okay? So if you have, what you've done is you've transferred resources from labor to capital. Human capital has gone down, and capitalized capital has gone up. But we don't notice the decrease in human capital. We don't capitalize that. But we do notice the increase in rents, the capitalized value of rents. So it looks like the wealth income ratio has gone up. I mean, it has gone up, but not the physical capital ratio. And in fact, in that particular example, the economy has become less productive because there's a distortion. Underneath the, the, the aggregation of the different sectors, there's a distortion caused by the increase in monop uh, monopoly power. So it's not that there's been a, a, you know, a, a positive change, it's a negative change associated with the increase in measured wealth. There are other examples like that. If the finance sector convinces Congress that uh, it's a good idea to bail out too big to fail banks because they're too big to fail and passes a, a law like the repeal of the Glass-Steagall that says you can be too big and we won't do anything, then the implicit ranks that are associated with the bailout, the bailout ranks, get capitalized in the banking sector. And that shows up as wealth in the stock market. But there's a negative to that, which is what? The implicit liability to the government, to the public, to the taxes. But that, and if it's a tax on wages, it doesn't show up on the balance sheet. So it doesn't show up as a, 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 the one side, the negative doesn't show up in the wealth statistics, the positive side does, and so you get an increase in, in wealth. Um, so again, you get an inefficiency, a negative productivity shock associated with an increase in wealth, a wealth income ratio. Well, let me say that, that uh, these, I, I view both of these explanations as uh, almost surely going on. They're complementary. There's no reason why you w one has to pick up. I think both of them have probably marked. Very hard to parse out the relative importance. Um, but two observations. If these are part of the explanation of what has gone on, then our anomalies are resolved or at least largely resolved. That is to say, the increase in wealth income ratio is not a corresponding increase in the capital income ratio and could actually be a decrease. If there's a decrease in the capital income ratio, corresponding to decrease in capital labor ratio, not a surprise that wages have stagnated or gone down. Just as an aside, I should know, improvements in technology only make some of the puzzles even more puzzling. For instance, there ought, I mean, in particular, there ought to be an improvement in either labor or capital augmentation there ought to be a shift outwards of the factor price frontier, and so at least one of the factors, either 
uh, it, uh, it would increase the presumption that wages would go down unless it's labor saving innovation, but then the interest rate return to capital should have gone way up. Well, uh, let me uh, uh, not spend a lot of time. There are lots of reasons why we might think that there's an increase in, co uh, in, in exploitation, monopoly power, uh, uh, lots of evidence in terms of various pieces of this puzzle, uh, 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 CEO pay, um, role of finance, and so forth. So, but let me just skip that and go on to the next part of the talk, which is focuses now on the distribution of wealth among individuals. So this part of the talk, I'm going to ignore both of the points that I've just made. And uh, I'm, I'm going to just assume capital, not land, no imperfections of competition. And I just, are, I'm going back and asking the question uh, to, can we explain the distribution of wealth among individuals? And this really revives the work that was in my earlier work uh, uh, papers, um, where it, it basically just traces uh, the idea that you have families who are accumulating capital out of savings and then dividing capital among their children. And what's happening to the wealth of the family really depends on how much they save, the return they get on savings, and uh, the, the number of children they have. And the stochastic process is describing those three variables. Okay. So uh, there's at least uh, an implication in some of uh, the discussion of Piketty's book that if capitalists are saving all their income, their wealth will grow at the rate R. And if R is greater than G, that means their wealth is growing faster than the economy. You get a, a, a simple explanation of why there, you, you would have both an increase in the wealth income ratio and why you might have increasing concentration a wealth at the top because these are the people who are saving and other people are just getting along. So that's, that's the kind of picture at least that one uh, has. Now, one of the uh, objections to this is that, that have been raised in several articles is that uh, capitalists save, and that's true, we're gonna see that that's not a very important uh, piece of the puzzle, um, that uh, hasn't, uh, doesn't take into account the division among heirs, that is actually important. And uh, the thing that's really important is obviously that the value of R has to be an endogenous variable. That if in, in any reasonable model, so that if people keep saving, the interest rate has to come down. And so you ought to view, you have to have a model with micro and macro consistency where the interest rate is itself determined in the model. So I begin the paper with a, a, a little anecdote that, that, you know, an anecdote is not a theorem, but at least it's sometimes instructive. Um, Rockefeller, uh, when uh, he died in the 1930s, uh, uh, his wealth uh, in, uh, uh, was about 1.4% of GDP at the time. And if you follow the kinds of numbers, the R's and the G numbers, okay, uh, that you, know, you assume he saved all of it and, and, and it, it uh, increased at the rate of interest that are in, in the standard tables, uh, their family wealth would be somewhat over $1 trillion. You know, not a lot, but um, <laughs> uh, do you know what their actual family, take all the members of the Rockefeller family together, do you know what their wealth is today? 10 billion, divided by 300 members. So they're, 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 they're almost paupers today. So uh, the point is that the RG, the, 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 the suggestion of the capitalist rising at the rate R and the rest of us going only at the rate G is creating this 
uh, this, this growing inequality is certainly belied by this example. And when you start thinking about who has the ability to get high returns, connections, and all that, clearly somebody with 1.4% of GDP ought to be able to, to do that, and yet it's gone the other way. Well, uh, uh, the model will give some inkling about what may have happened. Um, so th this is the basic uh, equation. Uh, and the basic idea is the following. If you write down, say, two families, I and J, and you ask about the difference in their capital per person. Okay, so that's the wealth of the family divided by the number of people in the family. Uh, it grows, uh, and they all grow at the, uh, have the same number of children, the same wage, the same savings rate, the same interest rate. Then what you get is this very simple result that regardless of the initial distribution of wealth, there will eventually be quality of wealth. So it was very uh, interesting, uh, nice result of Solo's original model is that it converges to complete equality. Now obviously something's left out of that because that's not what we have. Um, but uh, it's easy to extend this to a stochastic model where uh, assume that, that everybody has the same savings function, not wait, the savings rate, but savings function, where they're solving the same intertemporal utility function, uh, a dynastic utility functions, the wages are determined by the same stochastic process with a regression towards the means. Um, and then you can get very easily the result that there exists an equilibrium wealth distribution, uh, which is related to the nature of the stochastic process of wages and the intertemporal discount factor. The one I want to focus on, because it's much simpler, is the Caldorian savings rate, sa savings model. It's a simplification, but I think it has a lot to it. Uh, and that is, there are two classes in the economy. You have the capitalists up there who are uh, saving a large fraction of their income and leaving it to their children. And you have workers who are, and in this version, they're not saving anything, but in a little bit later, I'll have a life cycle version where they're saving for retirement. So you have ordinary people who are basically with a life cycle motive and then a few people, capitalists, who save and pass it on. Well, the basic equation uh, 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 very similar to, to what, what uh, I gave before, uh, results in the fact that uh, if S, R, and N are all the same, then the relative wealth of all families would remain the same. Any initial inequality of wealth would be perpetuated. And the magnitude of this wealth inequality in the short or long run does not depend on the relationship between R and G at all. So it's, it's just, you know, it's just a consequence of these very simple uh, income uh, dynamics. Finally, if, uh, if you have some families with, with uh, uh, higher savings rates or higher returns, then obviously it, its wealth would grow and uh, the aggregate savings rate for the economy would become dominated eventually by this family with a uh, very high savings rate. Well, uh, again, you could do the same kind of all families uh, analysis as I did before. If all families have the same S and have uh, uh, N and R described by the same stochastic functions, there will exist uh, an equilibrium wealth distribution. And it's actually easy to generate uh, uh, Pareto tails. In fact, one of the interesting things, if you go back to the earlier Sogo model, you can get very easy to get Pareto tails at the end and get a log normal distribution for the main body of the uh, uh, distribution reflecting uh, a, a log normal wage distribution. So in the long run equilibrium, not surprisingly, you get an equation that says the rate of interest is, great, is equal to n over s star. but so R is greater than the rate of growth. Uh, N is the rate of growth here of population or the rate of growth of population plus labor augmenting technical exchange. But there's no further concentration, uh, uh, in the, uh, in, no further increase in the wealth income ratio. 
Um, so what matters is the relationship between SR and the growth rate, not R and the growth rate. Um, and uh, let me just, so then in the paper I talk about a variety of forces creating more unequal wealth distributions or cre creating less unequal. So you can try to use this model to talk about centripetal forces, forces that you take this basic model and you, you, you know, the structure of the stochastic processes and you say what are, the force, what are the things that will lead to a more unequal distribution or forces that will lead to a less unequal distribution. So um, uh, uh, one of the forces uh, um, are that more dispersion of the returns and persistence of differences in returns will lead to a more dispersion of wealth. So if you have independent draws every time, you're going to have less dispersion. Okay? If you have a, a uh, more of a, ran a random walk with less regression towards the mean in either the return to labor or the return to capital, uh, the, the slower the regression to the mean, the more dispersion that there will be in inequality. Um, in the case of uh, families maximizing intergenerational utility, if each generation cares a great deal about future generations, then wealth will become more concentrated, uh, but inequality of consumption across generations will be lower. Uh, and if richer have smaller families, that will be more wealth inequality. Um, there are other forces. I, uh, um, if, if the very rich can use a position to get higher returns, more investment information, more extraction of ranks, and the very rich have equal or higher savings rate, then wealth will become more concentrated. And if richer individuals invest more in human capital so their children have higher wages, uh, there will be more wealth inequality. There's some other factors that, that can be either centripetal or centrifugal forces. For instance, rules on inheritance. Uh, in the UK, they uh, used to have primogeniture, and primogeniture meant that the eldest son inherited all the wealth. That was an inheritance rule that led to a lot of inequality. One had a lot of wealth. If you read any of the, the novels of the uh, 17th, 18th, 19th century, that, that was a big deal. And the other people didn't inherit anything. Uh, but if you have laws that have equal inheritance, then obviously that's an equalizing <coughs> factor. So there's some centripetal forces. Uh, one of them is uh, the rags to riches. If uh, the, if the uh, uh, children of rich people, uh, all you know, trust funders, we, uh, 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 have this proclivity to become drug addicts, uh, it's hard for them to perpetuate. Uh, you know, and at least uh, a lot of us have observed a lot of that kind of uh, <laughs> process. Uh, uh, here uh, in New York, um, and uh, in um, societies with good public education, equal provision of access to human capital is a very equalizing force. Unfortunately, in the United States, we spend more money on the children of rich than we do on children of the poor, so it's actually a centrifugal force, it's a, uh, unequalizing. Um, one of the uses of this kind of model is to think about what are the forces that have changed over the last 30 years, 40 years, that might have led to greater dispersion of wealth. And what were the forces that led to less dispersion of wealth in the 50s and 60s? Um, and uh, there are a number of these uh, that uh, I mentioned just as one example. Uh, Increase the sort of mating leads to more intergenerational inertia, more inequality, and uh, uh, so does economic segregation. Uh, and if you uh, create uh, education systems, selective education systems, where you make sure that only the children, or that the likelihood of the children of the elite go to the same school and meet other children of the elite, you actually get two for one. You get uh, more inequality in education and more 
uh, sort of mating. And the result of that is more inequality. Uh, the uh, second point here on the screen is a little bit more complicated, but it's an interesting one. Better annuity markets will lead to less wealth inequality. Uh, one of the sources of wealth inequality is that in the absence of annuity markets, at least in standard models, people save for the retirement. But they don't know how long that retirement is going to be. And if their children are lucky and they die right after they retire, um, they inherit a lot. But if they live to 105, there usually is nothing left. Uh, that's not actually quite true, but, but, but uh, in the simple models, that's true. So that uh, you can get, again, a Pareto distribution in the tail, you get a lot of inequality uh, in inheritance simply out of the fact that people save for the retirement, even in a life cycle model, just from the fact that they are uncertain about their death. And then, of course, they pass on that, that wealth to their children, and if they're, that same effect can go on in the next generation. Well, if you have annuity markets, that problem doesn't occur. You, you just buy annuities. The same thing is true about Social Security, which is you can think of as an annuity market. It means that people don't have to save for their retirement, and you don't get this as a source of inequality. It also means that measured wealth inequality also means something different than it did before, because they don't have the same amount of retirement savings. You might say they have it, but it's not booked to them. It's not included in the, in the accounts. So increased variance in life expectancy, poor Social Security result in more wealth inequality. Well, the final set of models has to do with life cycle models, where the, here, here the focus is on the role of life cycle savings versus inherited savings. And I think the, the basic insight here, so there I had two, two groups in the population, these capitalists who are just saving mechanically and leaving it to their children, who then leave it to their children, and the other group who are saving for the retirement. So it's a polar model. The interesting thing about that model is the steady state level of capital is determined simply by capital savings propensity. And worker savings propensity then only affects the share of wealth that goes to workers. Okay? So the capital stock is basically determined by capitalists and workers affect the, cap the, the share. Um, what's uh, important about that is if you think about capital taxation, if that model is correct, you have to be very sensitive to shifting. Of course, this is a general theory that everybody knows about taxation, that you always have to worry about shifting. In this model, you get the uh, very disturbing result that the after-tax return in capital is not affected by the tax. <laughs> it gets fully shifted. So it's all very nice and good for, for uh, uh, people to say, let's tax the rich impose a capital gains tax, that'll take the returns away, but in this model, the net effect of it is, I don't believe this model, let me make clear, but, but in this model, the returns to capital go up, and the after-tax return uh, is the same. Well, then you might have thought, okay, well, let's take that revenue that we got from the tax and give it to workers, at least the workers were going to be better off. And the answer turns out to be, uh, in general, uh, ambiguous. Uh, actually, in that particular experiment, the workers are worse off. If you have a general capital tax, workers are uh, going to be worse off. But there is so, uh, something you can do, is if you take that revenue, and rather than than um, uh, give it as a, a lump, uh, as a payment to workers, if you invest it in public investment to offset the decrease in investment and savings by the private sector, then you can, effect, uh, you can undo the shifting 
you can undo the effect of the, of, the, of the shifting, and the net effect is that workers are better off. So let me go quickly to the second part of, of the paper, which is uh, on land. And uh, why, remember, the, 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 it's going back to the question, how do we, exp uh, if there is a, how do we explain the disparity? The savings data doesn't, can't account even for the maintenance of the capital uh, output ratio, let alone an increase in the capital output ratio. And what else is going on? One of them is, I said, possibly an increase in market power. And another explanation is an increase in the price of land. But if you're going to have that as an explanation, you have to have something about the drivers of the price of land. So um, uh, the basic idea here is that there are a couple explanations for the price of land uh, go through. One is land is a positional good as wealth goes up or the wealth of the wealthy goes up. They will demand more land. They all want the land in Riviera and the price in Riv uh, of land in Riviera goes up. And the net effect of that you can show very clearly is that the price of the uh, uh, land will go up uh, and, and will absorb a lot of the savings. So you'll, the, the wealth will go up far faster than the capital stock. The second one is, goes back to the general fact that if you have land and capital, you have a economic model with two capital goods. And in general, models with two capital goods without infinite futures markets are not stable. Very easy to get bubbles. And uh, uh, the result of that is that on these bubble paths, you can easily get you know, the, the standard differentiation, the return on capital is equal to the return on land, including capital gains, going off in a bubble path where capital stock is going uh, down and uh, unstable, it will eventually get corrected, but it may get corrected to another bubble path. So that's a, a, a second uh, possible explanation. There's a third one, which is that land is used as collateral for credit, and if there's a change in the rules of the game about the provision of credit, the value of land as collateral can go up and so you'll get an increase in the price of land through the uh, financial system. And that's obvious, you know, lots of examples of the link between credit and inequality. Obtaining the banking license was critical in the creation of Russian oligarchs. The way they got their money is they first got a banking license, then they issued them themselves a loan to buy the assets that the state was privatizing. So uh, for any of you wanting to make a lot of money, that's really the key Get, get your governments to, to give you a license before they privatize, and then do a special deal to make sure you can get the asset on the cheap. So uh, uh, that uh, provides a, 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 a theory of why uh, the, the price of uh, uh, land could have gone up as much as it did. Um, final observation, because I, uh, that I make is, is um, if we're trying to use this as part of a theory of, uh, of, of inequality, we also have to explain a fact, which is, uh, we have to explain dis differences in the ownership of different assets. That is to say, why is it that the, wealthies, the wealthy people have a composition of assets that is biased towards assets that are collateralizable? And very easy to create those theories because there are different risk properties. What this is, uh, where this gets important is in current macroeconomic analysis. If you look at what's been happening recently, the people who own government bonds are life cycle savers. The people who own equities are the capitalists in the models that I've described. And what does that mean if we lower the interest rate? Usually in the old analysis, a classical analysis, Caldorian analysis, uh, 
uh, would say the conflict is between workers and capitalists. And lowering interest rate is good for workers and bad for capitalists. It's a redistribution from, uh, uh, you know, it, it was always soft money is what the what the, 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 cap, the workers were debtors, they wanted low interest rates, that was the election of 1896. Uh, so there's, you know, th that's been the usual analysis. Well this has the effect, if you, if you have this division that I just described or sort of hinted at, you get a very different outcome. You lower the interest rate, it's the life cycle savers who had safe portfolios who get screwed the old people who are depending on, on who, hold, who, who follow the advice of the advisor and hold safe portfolios of T-bills, they are ravaged by this. And what happens is the corporations borrow at the low interest rate and the value of equities go up and that gets exactly what we've seen. It's a redistribution. The people who suffer are the workers. The people who gain are, are the, the, the capitalists and the, you know, the, the wealthy. So this suggests another division of the organization of our economy that's a little bit different from the way we've, we've thought about it, which is you know, capital and labor, which says we really have to be sensitive to the composition of ownership of the assets and, and think about how various policies affect, uh, affect that. I think. Uh, let me, uh, uh, what this suggests is a key driver of inequality in our society today is the financial system, including the, fin the provision of credit, the rules that govern that. Uh, and in analyzing the impact on inequality of different policies, the old distinction between capitalists and workers may be less relevant than between holders of equity and holders of debt. And, um, okay, let me just stop there. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks to um, INET and uh, Joe's INET group for the invitation. We're trying to sort of build the New York INET net I something um, here. And uh, I also uh, wanted to start by applauding the return to Ricardo. I, I think that's, that's an excellent forward motion for economics, um, in fact and maybe even a return to um, some figures like Luigi Passanetti, whose theorem um, uh, we also um, uh, heard. Um, so let me just um, very briefly um, summarize some agreement uh, with uh, Joe's talk. I think um, he is on the mark in uh, fo uh, focusing on Piketty's confusing terminology that conflates wealth and capital. Um, I think uh, he also puts his finger on the key point that the explosion of inequality in the last 25 years is closely associated with the growing importance of capitalized rents in wealth. Uh, and those two things, if you're working on this, I think you want to keep your eye on as uh, fundamental points. Um, I think um, uh, Joe also focused attention appropriately on the question of how the rate of return to wealth can remain high in the face of an enormous accumulation of wealth. And um, this is an issue that Piketty uh, has been uh, somewhat pressed to explain. If you're interested in this, I'm going to go in a slightly different direction for the main part of my remarks. Um, there is uh, some further discussion of this that uh, is based on um, non-neoclassical models, and especially models that do not depend so much on the framework of the aggregate production function. And I have a, uh, uh, the uh, web page, uh, the SEPA web page, where there's a collection of very interesting papers that Lance Taylor put together, uh, which are responses to Piketty from, from that point of view, and discuss the questions of rate of return and accumulation 
without necessarily assuming an aggregate production function. And um, some of those are quite are interesting. Um, Joe and I used to sit um, in his office sometimes and discuss models and modeling uh, philosophy. Um, and uh, often this, uh, these discussions uh, revolved around whether you should have a lot of models for different purposes or should have one model that explained everything. Both of these maybe have defects as economic methodology. Um, but the um, models that we've uh, heard summarized uh, are really, in my view, where you want to start if you want to try to think about differences in wealth is the dynamic equilibrium result of differences in saving propensities, asset rates of return, and these uh, basic points of view. And that raises the question of the quantitative importance of these factors in the real world. And I'd just like to bring up uh, another uh, point of view about this. Not so much because it's um, in opposition to anything Joe said, but I think it's complementary to it, um, that uh, there are some uh, facts about wealth and income distributions which are, um, which point to an uh, intersection between traditional economic methodology based on dynamic equilibrium ideas and um, the work of statistical physics or ideas of statistical physics that are based on statistical equilibrium ideas. And I'd just like to bring this data to your attention as part of this meeting because I assume there are a lot of people here are kind of interested in um, the uh, problem of wealth distribution. I'm going to, there's actually a fairly wide variety of papers on this. I'm the person that I happen to know who's done, I think, quite good work on this is uh, Victor Yakovienko at the University of Maryland, um, who has what he calls a two-class theory of income distribution. And he argues, uh, he's a, a physicist, and he argues from the statistical physics point of view, that the lower 97% of the income range, predominantly wages in advanced capitalist countries, 97% uh, is a, not an exact number, but it's uh, roughly what he finds in a number of countries, is distributed as an exponential distribution that appears structurally stable over time. And the stability of this and the fit of this are quite remarkable and maybe are something that's worth trying to fit together with um, the models that Joe put forward. The top 3% of income in Yakovienko's view is distributed as a power law. Uh, Joe mentioned the importance of being able to produce Pareto distributions out of the dynamic equilibrium models that he was looking at, um, which uh, actually have a shifting location. So I'd just like to take a minute, um, Martin, you keep on, keep on my uh, case here. Um, uh, this, uh, they're just two slides, and I just want to get the image of them uh, in your minds because they're so uh, extraordinary. Um, what uh, Yakovenko does here is that he plots the probability distribution and the cumulative distribution of um, uh, income. Uh, these, this is for the bottom 97%, so this is the part that is probably largely, um, um, largely wages. Um, he displaces two periods. This is 1983 to 1989, the bottom curves. The top are 1990 to 2001, the top curves. And what's remarkable about this, first of all, that these fits are um, extremely good. Um, Joe pointed out that economists have tended to characterize these distributions as log normal distributions. And an important question um, is statistically is uh, exactly how to distinguish those. From my point of view, what's kind of interesting, though, is that the exponential distribution is, in fact, what you might call the signature of a, a statistical equilibrium process. That is a process that's governed to a considerable degree by a completely random exploration of all uh, of the possibilities, possible states of the system, which is a little bit different from the equilibrium dynamics uh, way of thinking about it, although it may, as I'll say in a moment, not be so um, in, uh, inconsistent with it. Um, the second plot uh, widens the adjusted uh, gross income uh, considerably, so we now see the top 3%. 
And uh, this uh, plot is plotted on a log log scale. So the Pareto distribution appears as a straight line here, as opposed to the previous plot, where it's the exponential distribution. That's a semi-log plot that appears as a straight line. And again, you see the extremely good fit to the exponential in the bottom part of the distribution. And he's able to rescale um, income in such a way that it lands exactly on the same curve over 20 years. Physicists really like this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, it, it might be, while that doesn't necessarily make it right or better than anything else, um, it maybe is something that is worth um, economists taking into account and trying to understand what the relation of these kind of statistical regularities is to the uh, model, uh, dynamic modeling um, concerns that Joe was mentioning. It suggests that statistical regularities are very powerful statistical equilibrium forces, and that has some uh, considerable implications if it's true for policy. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the statistical forces are inconsistent with the modeling of individual differences, because it may be that the individual differences in people's education and their earning power and so forth are exactly the items that are being scrambled together by the random processes that uh, are leading to the statistical equilibrium. Um, for example, wage income may be correlated highly with education, but education, as uh, Joe pointed out dynamically, may be subject to important statistical equilibrium regularities that lead to a lot of inequality. Um, one advantage of the statistical equilibrium approach is its parsimony. Um, instead of having to think of a whole lot of parameters, say, to govern stochastic processes on um, rates of return uh, and uh, fertility and other important uh, parts of it, um, you actually get the, the statistical equilibrium results without uh, so much um, expense in parameterization as uh, dynamic equilibrium. Um, but if statistical equilibrium is really there, it poses a much steeper hill for policy than the dynamic equilibrium results um, suggest. Um, Joe rep uh, uh, remarked at the end, and I think it's a very important part of his talk, that it's very possible that uh, measures that you think are going to do something for income or wealth distribution may backfire. And you, you gave a couple of examples of how that uh, can happen. If the statistical equilibrium um, tendencies are very ingrained in the social structure of the economy, then it's almost certain that many of them are going to backfire. Or if we're going to try to uh, avoid their backfiring, we have to at least test um, the implication of these policy levers on the uh, parameters that determine the statistical equilibrium of wealth and income. Um, so those are my remarks, and I hope I'm within my 12 minutes. Okay, so let me try to uh, stay a little bit short here. Um, so I, th I think, you know, obviously, I, I don't know, I don't think we'd be having this discussion if it weren't for Piketty's book. And uh, um, at least we wouldn't have as many people in the room. Uh, and, uh, and I want to structure these remarks partly about uh, Piketty, uh, maybe Piketty as, as, as perceived versus Piketty what's actually in the book, um, and, and a couple of the issues. And I actually uh, want to do the issues that Joe raised in reverse. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the personal distribution of wealth, uh, and then talk about land and all of that. Um, so on the personal side, it, what's interesting is a, a lot of the way that uh, people have described Piketty is, as it says, this proposition that if R is greater than G, then you have an ongoing, unlimited, no, no end to the process accumulation of wealth in the hands of, 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 a, of a super elite. 
Um, Joe used an interesting phrase. I just I thought it was interesting enough to uh, to write down. As he said, it's a, he said it's an implication of some of the discussions, but that's not actually what it says in Piketty, right? It's not actually what it says in Capital in the 21st century, and it's certainly not what Piketty thinks. And it's not what anybody reasonably would think. You would think that there is some process that uh, in which this this you know something. Um, uh, in which the R minus G is a way of thinking about how accumulation can happen. So I actually just did a cut and paste from the ebook edition. Uh, and what Piketty actually says there uh, is that uh, he's got an equilibrium story uh, in which uh, people can accumulate wealth, fa dynastic patrimonial capitalist families can accumulate wealth, um, but uh, stuff happens. So it's not without limits, and it does end up as an equilibrium uh, distribution of wealth, uh, which, uh, given a lot of plausible ways you might tell the story, is going to produce a uh, Pareto distribution at the top. So in fact, it's it's you know it's the kind of thing that everybody's been talking about here that you you would he expects I would expect everyone would expect that you're, any story you tell like this is very likely to give you in the end um, a power law of of wealth distribution at the top and. Um, uh, also, uh, you also hear some people, again, I think on a casual read, people think that he's saying that R is something that's given independent of, of, of capital, which is, but that's a secondary point here. Um, they, I find it helpful to just, I'm, I'm in the, the many different models camp. Uh, I find it helpful to just think of, of simple stories to kind of illustrate. So here's my ver simple version of the kind of thing we may be talking about. And uh, I picked up from Bronco and then from Piketty that uh, thinking about 19th century literature is really helpful here. Um, that think about families that are accumulating wealth um, generation after generation, except there's always a chance that the next generation is uh, going to squander it all at, at card games and horses. And, uh, um, and that's going to give you right away if you think that provided, first of all, you need saving times the rate of return on the wealth to be greater than the growth rate of the economy if you're going to have an increasing share uh, in the hands of these families even before the wastrel comes along. Uh, but, and then if you add that together with every once in a while somebody blows up the family fortune, you're going to end up with an equilibrium di uh, distribution of wealth where families that have managed to go five generations before it gets blown on cards and horses will be to families that managed to go six as families that have gone four are to families of five. It's going to be a self-similar uh, thing, and so you're going to end up, you know, th obviously this is not going to be your sole model, although again, if I believe those 19th century novels, it's actually a pretty good story about, about distribution of wealth at the top. Uh, very naturally going to come up with something that looks like a Pareto distribution. Um, and it's going to depend on what rates of return are compared with the growth rate of the economy. You're going to, it's, it's not a simple, if R is greater than G, you have an unlimited accumulation. In fact, R has to be probably substantially greater than G for you to be able to get a lot of concentration of wealth at the top. So a, a society which is rapidly forming new wealth, like the United States in the Gilded Age, is going to be less like this. A society that is not so rapidly forming wealth, but then has a, uh, but, but still has a fairly high return on existing wealth, uh, is, going to, is going to look like this. And one of the things, by the way, I, I thought it was really helpful for those of us who are Americans and don't know nothing about the rest of the world to uh, have uh, the Piketty saying that, you know, we really want to think about Belle Epoque France, not Gilded Age America, as, as a model for where we might be going. I think in, in a lot of ways that, that's useful. Um, that's really all I have to say. Oh, I just would, I guess I'd like to say, Duncan, that, that uh, statistical distributions are at least potentially should be important clues. I don't think in itself, they, in and of themselves, they tell us how easy it is or how hard it is to move those things. And although they might potentially be important clues, um, I have a fair bit of experience with this because of other fields. Uh, we, we, there's a, an incredibly powerful, exact statistical regularity on the size distribution of cities, where it's Pareto with, with an exponent of one. And um, and a further empirical observation that anybody who spends too much time trying to understand why that's true ends up going mad. So, uh, I, you know, it's not clear that that's really where you want to go. Um, I mean, anyway. All right, land. Um, I'm calling, everyone's calling it uh, return to Ricardo. In fact, I've been calling it that, but actually it really isn't. Because if we are thinking about the role of land in 21st century economies, we are really not talking for the, 
except for a very small fraction, about land in the Ricardian sense where there's land that's good and land that's not so good and you have a gradient. Um, land, yes, there is agricultural land out there, uh, but the land that accounts for most of the value of land in, in modern societies derives its value not from the inherent productivity of the land, but from urbanization or at least agglomeration, which means from external economies. So the, the land, actually, the land in the Santa Clara Valley of California is really very good land. And it's, a, it's particularly, it's, it, we know what it's good for. It's really good for growing apricots. Um, but actually, there aren't any apricots grown there anymore because that's now Silicon Valley. Okay, and so uh, the value of that land is quite high, uh, but it's not coming from anything that, any process that Ricardo would have, have, uh, have described, probably would have recognized it. There were such things even in the early 19th century, but not something that, that he would have, uh, uh, it, not something that's in, in principles of political economy. Um, so, but, and that's great, I, I like that, because that's, that's, you know, that, that's my home turf, so I, I love the idea that land should be a really important part of our stories. Um, but I got, I want to be sure that, that this is, is really right. And so, uh, now there are some various estimates, and people have been taking some of the data in Picty and seeing, saying that a lot of the wealth is housing, but I just wanted to see if I could do land. I've, just a quick thing from the U.S. F f uh, flow of funds accounts. Now, we can, a we can ask how good those are, but for what it's worth, we can actually get, um, uh, we have the value of real estate. Now, I, this is only for real estate owned by households, and there is a little bit more that's owned by, by the corporate sector, although, uh, but it doesn't change the calculation much. And, uh, and we also have an estimate in those accounts of the replacement cost of the structures. And so the difference is, presumably, is supposed to be the value of the land itself. And what we find is that over the past um, almost 40 years, um, if we ask what, the sh what share of the total of the net worth of the household, household and nonprofit sector is land, it was 8.4%, it's now 10.6%, which is not trivial, but not exactly overwhelming. It's not, it's not the kind of number that would support making land the core of your story about what's going on here. So either there's something very wrong with the flow of funds numbers, or this is actually not the direction you want to go, which I'm very disappointed in, but I don't, because I love the story that says that, that values of land coming from agglomeration economies are, are a central factor in, in the evolution of, of everything, but I, I don't really see it. Okay, um, about growth and distribution, are, are, are there really, really big puzzles in, uh, in the data. And, and here I think uh, we do want to say that some of the way that Piketty sells his stuff um, is misleading, even though it's not exactly wrong. Uh, the, a lot of the, of the discussion is as if this changes in wealth are, changes in the wealth to GDP ratio are what's driving everything. Uh, and there are these big changes in the wealth to GDP ratio, but even if you really look at the numbers, that's not what's driving everything. Uh, so if, if you want to make you know, rising K over Y be everything, then first of all, you need, for the whole story to work, you need an elasticity of substitution that's substantially bigger than one, uh, which might be true, but probably isn't, and you certainly wouldn't want to lean on that very hard. Um, but, uh, and, and also, if that's the only thing that's going on, uh, you have a hard time explaining lagging real wages. But if you ask about what is really responsible for the drop in, in wealth and the drop in the concentration of wealth in Piketty's data during the 20th century, it's, it, it's not. It, it's not, it's not about, it isn't even about growth rates. It's about the, the destruction of a lot of wealth by, uh, by wars, by uh, inflating away the value of bonds. The, it's about uh, uh, very high rates of, of, um, uh, of inheritance taxation. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's policy and events, not, not production function stories, which, uh, um, which by the me way means that the, the Rockefeller example is not as salient as I wish it were. Because, you know, uh, the fact that Rockefeller had a lot of money in 1913 and his descendants don't have that much money in 2013, there were a few things that happened along the way in between. And, uh, and they're the kinds of things that in general destroyed dynastic fortunes all around the world. Um, I don't quite understand uh, I, ha I have problems with, tech, with uh, t attributing too much to, to the factor bias of technological change, uh, always. And I think that skill bias technological change is an idea that 
has played a, a central role in our debate and is almost certainly mostly wrong as a story about what's been going on these last few decades. Um, but capital bias technological change is certainly a feasible story. And I don't see why there's a, there's a necessary inconsistency between rising capital um, labor and, and rising capital output ratios and stagnant wages. Uh, as long as you have the right bias in the technological change, that's perfectly fine. And that, this is not the first time that has happened. We, we, the, the data aren't so good, but we think that the first uh, 30 years of the, uh, of the 19th century in, in Britain were a time of clearly must have been rising capital output ratios, must have been lots of capital accumulation, uh, but also, as best we can tell, stagnant real wages. So th these things can happen before. And, and in that story, I don't think you want to say that market power is a big, I, I, I like market power as a story. Market power, I, I think, helps explain a different puzzle, which is how we can have a rising, what appears to be a rising rate of return on capital if you take the capital share of income divided by the capital stock, combined with uh, very low real interest rates. Uh, it doesn't look as, people don't seem to perceive the return on, on a marginal dollar of capital as being anything like the return on an average dollar of capital, and that's something that only really happens if you have market power. So maybe that's there. But, um, but I, I don't see this as a, as a, as a big puzzle. Um, so I think there's a, I don't think we have paradoxes here. I think we have things we're trying to understand. I think we may have come out of the elation at, at having Piketty's book finally really put this stuff on the map. Um, go away. Uh, um, but um, uh, we may have let uh, ourselves get carried away with, with the comprehensiveness of the explanation. Um, but I think there, and, and I, 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 I'm really, I regret uh, the land thing. I, w I would love to make that the core of the story, personally, professionally, intellectually. In fact, I, I, just two days ago, I was getting all ready to start writing some models about agglomeration economies and growth and distribution, and then I decided I should actually check the data first, and they just don't, they just won't bear that weight. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. It is, of course, uh, thank you, Joe, for the invitation. It's, of course, a pleasure to be here. So I'm not going to, you know, spend too long a time because I know that you would like to ask questions. So, and uh, I will skip over some of the puzzles that actually Joe has talked about before. I luckily didn't put paradoxes there. I could have easily done that, but I, I kept the word puzzles. Uh, this is actually a huge... Uh, paper, and I was actually not sure if it was one paper. I thought it was at least two papers or even more. And uh, um, obviously, the, I'm not going to, to summarize it, and you have heard Joe speak about it. I was just really sort of, um, how should I say, a little bit titillated, excited by the fact when I actually looked at the paper, I honestly immediately recognized something that I actually read in the uh, 1970s. I was not here at 1966, the conference, but I read the paper from, uh, this was actually published in 1969, and uh, when I actually, before reading the current version, well, improved version, I actually went back to my notes from 1970-something, and uh, actually reread them, and um, actually I could understand the paper, I think, a little bit better after reading the, the, the I mean, Joe's paper from 1969. And I said I would never thought I would actually be able to sort of discuss that with Joe, but um, unfortunately I, my comments here would be mostly on part one, which deal with, with land, and I would just end with very few things on the second part. Uh, first of all, actually, the wealth is not capital. E even, you know, when I read early on the book, I noticed that, of course, Piketty puts it in a, in a footnote that he's using these terms. So it's really not Arthur Goldhammer who kind of did that. It's actually he uses the three terms in French uh, interchangeably. So capital, uh, wealth, and assets, practically, are used interchangeably. And I think for, for W, for wealth, to be used in a personal income distribution is absolutely fine, and the fact that he uh, actually imputes the return to housing as part of income is absolutely fine. That's what we do all the time in uh, income distribution data. It's okay. The problems start, actually, as Joel said, is when you move from this W world 
into the K world because you actually, from the K world, uh, from the theory of growth and production functions, you actually take some regularities and you move sort of uh, uh, seamlessly between the two. And uh, of course, uh, the W and K, I became more aware of that, actually, uh, maybe some other people have mentioned it as well, but certainly by now, uh, that actually they are not exactly the same. Um, so then actually, you know, um, we all looked at, uh, I mean, different authors. So I actually went and looked actually what Adam Smith wrote about that. And here you have the quotes. I'm not going to read you all of them. Uh, oh, the first one is actually basically saying wealth is different from capital which, as I said, I mean, I pronounce that as correct statement. Uh, and then the second one, he says, actually, the implicit income should be disregarded from implicit income from housing should not be really included in income, uh, as a thing which we routinely do in household surveys or income distributions. And of course, I had to pronounce on that one that he was not correct. Um, and then, of course, Joel, of course, addresses this issue, that actually attracted me quite a lot. It's actually basically saying, okay, wealth is really capital, uh, the usual productive capital, the world of K, plus rent, which is capitalized at the rate of return of, of R. And then you have, of course, the thing that in the in equilibrium, obviously rent plus expected increase in the value price of capital or price of land should be equal to some return that you have from capital. And I put here between, this is like the equation that comes from, from Joe's paper, but I put on top of that, I actually put here R, which is the rate of return, uh, which is actually in, in, I think in this example, was the rate, rate of return on financial assets. So basically we have three things, which I thought actually in equilibrium, I believe they should be in, in equilibrium, but it was here assumed that actually the, the credit is costless. It comes at the, rate of, uh, at the rate of interest of zero. So we have R as the rate of interest. We have expected, we have return on land, and we have the return on physical capital. So somehow they should be in, in equilibrium, all three of them, and actually, I actually don't see them in the paper as, as being in, in equilibrium. Um, then the second question I'd ask myself, why is land really different from other things? In other words, why instead of increased demand for land, what happens if we assume that there is increased demand, for example, old paintings? And I think to some extent they are similar. It seems to me what is happening there is that actually you have an increased demand for an asset, that, uh, for an asset or asset class that is predominantly held by the rich. So in other words, it's not uh, any kind of land. It seems to me it's really real estate, actually, as Paul was saying before. It's a typical, real, it's a real estate, but the real estate which needs to be demanded by the rich and it has to be either held by the other rich or by somebody who is well off. Uh, so that essentially what then happens is that component of wealth which is predominantly held by the rich goes up in value. And of course, wealth inequality increases thereby. And because income, to some is essentially, uh, com if you will, conversion or imputation from wealth inequality, income inequality goes up. So I see here really sort of a uh, demand, increased demand for land is basically um, simply an increased demand for a particular asset. That asset could be old master's paintings or it could be land, which is held by the rich. Now, the difference Oh, why is I think land different is because that particular land is a big portion of the, of the assets. Although, of course, as Paul said today, actually I didn't know the numbers. I, thought, I suppose it was big, but if it was 10%, of course, it is not that big, but it could be that it's, it's not 10% in the portfolio of the rich. It could be the 10% the overall uh, share. So th this is how I would see this story. So I would not see here the land as being really unique. It's very special because it, it's, I think it's actually a big asset and again it has to be held by the rich. Then another sort of thought that I had when I read the paper was what, I, what you can call contagion or transmission of inequality under globalization. It's actually implicit in Joe's, actually even explicit in Joe's paper. And I thought here of the following situation. Now leave the U.S. aside because U.S. is really a big country which is driven by its own endogenous developments. But think of Portugal. And I thought of Portugal which had recently uh, uh, a large increase in demand for land, actually for real estate coming from China essentially, but also Russia and elsewhere. So let's, uh, let's suppose, going back to Ricardo, but now with Portugal also as an example, like uh, 
obviously very old-fashioned in that sense. So let's suppose uh, uh, oligarchs from Russia and China demand land in Portugal. That land was used as a vineyard before. So what happens? You have withdrawal of that land, which was used for productive purposes, and you have an increase in demand, and you have actually increased wealth of the Portuguese who are selling that land to the Chinese. So in the production function, you either have no change, or even you have slight downward change, because you have K and, and L remaining the same, and some of the T is being withdrawn from production. But you actually have a real, I believe, real increase in wealth of the Portuguese because they are all able now with that greater wealth, which is actually the money that they got from the Chinese, to actually purchase, by, if they were to liquidate their wealth, they would actually be able to purchase more assets or more goods and services abroad. So I think it's a real increase in wealth of the Portuguese. But the long-term growth is unaffected because the capital and labor are unchanged. However, the wealth distribution, assuming that that land which was sold was owned by the rich Portuguese, becomes more unequal, and income distribution becomes more unequal. So in, on the balance, I think it's basically what we deal here with is, it seems to me, sort of a wealth inequality effect. When I say it's kind of strange, but it's actually that there is a wealth I effect due to the rising relative price of one big assets held by the non-poor. I will now skip the word rich because maybe that his asset is not held only by the rich, but maybe by the middle class as well. But I really see that as a kind of a, uh, well, we had the Pigou effect, which was, of course, wealth and consumption. But here it's really demand for a type of wealth which leads to an increase of inequality of wealth and then income. So my final uh, note is simply on the... Uh, s one point on the modeling assumptions, and of course I couldn't follow, and actually I followed more when Joe presented his second part, actually first part of the paper today. But let me just say one thing, which actually I, w I was very impressed with the recent paper, which is uh, by Tony Atkinson, Christoph Lachner, who was a co-author on my paper before, and Rolf Oberg from, from Norway which uses the same data that Piketty and Saez have used. And what they find, uh, they actually look at the composition of capital and labor, I mean, composition of uh, income, particularly of the top, but actually everybody. And what they find is that more and more, you have association between high capital incomes and high labor incomes. And to my mind, it's actually a very new feature of modern capitalism, which like division, need division into capitalists and laborers, really does not capture. So in that case, what they argue actually is that the marginal, uh, the, the likelihood of being, having high capital income is very high if you have also very high labor income. It's a little bit less likely that if you have very high capital income, you have also very high labor income. But the idea is very, sim very kind of simple. If you have people with very high labor incomes, they eventually save a large chunk of that labor income. They themselves or their children become capitalists, but they also do work because they get good education and go to school. So they don't exactly dissipate those fortunes. And that actually leads me to the, to the really last point, is simply to say that when we model that, I would like, and I don't know how to do that, but I would like to model somehow that actually your heterogeneous wage rate also depends or is linked with your capital uh, position. In other words, I would like to have a situation where you have rich workers and rich capitalists sort of being the same individuals. And that would be, I think, that, um, I think that's something that we have really to think about, that, uh, about in the future because it seems to me that really division into rich capitalists and even this division that Yakovlenko has with 97.3 uh, misses that point that we might actually have the unification of incomes, high incomes in the same people. So thank you very much.